A casual worship caution. This is part two of two, and we're in our series, The Control Freaks, Guide to Joy, going through the book of Ecclesiastes. A key theme in the book of Ecclesiastes is that we often in life don't get to pick the times we were predetermined to go through. And that includes the hard times, that includes the difficult times, it includes times of change, when you don't necessarily want things to change. It may be a time to weep and mourn, or a time to lose or cast away, or a time to tear and hate, or even a time for war. And of course, we all love Romans 8.28, and we know that for, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. An another quote from Thomas Watson, he uh, said this about Romans 8.28. He said, the providences of God are sometimes dark and our eyes are so dim we can hardly make them out. We cannot unbridle providence, but we can believe that it will work together for the good of the elect. The clock's movements seem to work contrary to one another, but they forward the motion of the clock, making it strike. So the providences, providences of God carry on the good of the elect. Pricking a vein is in itself evil and hurtful, but as it tends to the health of the patient, it is good. Affliction is not joyous, but grievous, yet the Lord turns it to the good of his saints. Poverty shall starve their sins and affliction shall prepare them for a kingdom. Christians believe that God loves you and that he will cross providences to promote his glory and your good. Nothing comes to pass except what is ordained by God's decree and ordered by his providence. We sometimes fear what the issue of things will be when men grow high in their professions, but let us not make things worse by our fear. Men are limited in their power and cannot go further than God's providence permits. When Israel was encompassed between Pharaoh and the Red Sea, some of their hearts began to tremble and they were dead men. But providence ordered that the sea was a safe passage to Israel and a sepulcher to Pharaoh and his host. That's Thomas Watson. Our text that we started last week is about entering into worship, corporate worship, with reverence and godly awe. I, I want to read the first two verses as a reminder of Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better than to offer a sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your hearts be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are, you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. I opened last week by talking about our clothing and worship as one of the many ways we can show respect in the corporate worship. I, I want to give a couple more examples that might be just as awkward. If we, if we realized, if we realized what we were doing every Lord's Day, we wouldn't do a lot of things that we do, and we would do some things that we're not doing. Everyone should come mentally, spiritually, emotionally prepared to enter into the presence of God. When Moses was rebuking the sons of Korah for their sin, he said this to them, Numbers 16, 8, and 9. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of Yahweh, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? In other words, isn't the fact that you get to draw near to God in a special way and worship him and serve him in the tabernacle, isn't that in itself a huge deal? He said they were treating it like a small thing. So what are some of the other ways we can show reverence in our corporate worship? Well, come early. 
and start on time. You notice that uh, we started on time today. I knew what I was going to be preaching about. The fact that we have a problem with this, I would say is mostly my fault because I haven't made it a, a strict thing to start on time. I'm usually here early, but we often don't start on time. And that's me giving you guys the wrong message, right? That's giving the wrong message. So I apologize for that. I uh, ask you to forgive me for that. Things are going to change. The first sentence of our text was, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Maybe we can also say, guard your drive and the time it takes to get to the house of God. These are just some of the ways that we can prevent treating the Lord's service like a small thing. There's other examples. I'm not going to get into them, but just maybe mention a few more awkward examples. Uh, the bathroom. Uh, sometimes I think we use it too much. I mean, I know it's possible. I know a lot of people have little kids, and that's a, kind of the exception. But uh, I think you can go to the bathroom before. Just fewer distractions, the better. I know it's possible because I've never gone to the bathroom during the whole service. <laughs> never done it. So I, I'm being a good example in that area. <laughs> you apologize to me. <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes you want to get water. Okay, have your water with you. You can last without water. Whispering, scrolling. These are all ways that we... Uh, are not showing that we believe that we're supposed to, we're at, in the house of God. We're show, supposed to worship in godly fear, in awe and reverence. This is ways we can treat this service more reverently. This I found this. The Westminster Director, Directory of Public Worship has some interesting, kind of similar instructions and on the sections that's uh, highlighted of the assembling of the congregation and their behavior in the public worship of God. Here's what they say. When the congregation is to meet for public worship, the people having been prepared or having before prepared their hearts thereunto ought all to come and join therein, not absenting themselves from the public ordinance through negligence or upon pretense of private meetings, let all enter the assembly, not irreverently, but in a grave and seemly manner, taking their seats or places without adoration or bowing themselves towards one place or other. The congregation being assembled, the minister, often, after solemn calling on them to the worshiping of the great name of God, is to begin with prayer. Then they actually give a prayer, but I'll skip that. The public worship being begun, the people are holy to attend upon it, forbearing to read anything, this is uh, before we had cell phones, you know, and smartphones. Forbearing to read anything except what the minister is then reading or citing, and abstaining much more from all private whisperings, conferences, salutations, or doing reverence to any person present, or coming in as also from all gazing, sleeping, <laughs> and other indecent behavior, which may disturb the minister or people, or hinder themselves or others in the service of God. It's interesting, huh? And if any, through necessity, be hindered from being present at the beginning, they ought not, when they come into the congregation, to betake themselves to their private devotions, but reverently to compose themselves to join with the assembly in that ordinance of God, which is then in hand. So that's from the, uh, what was it? The Westminster Directory of Public Worship. Nothing new under the sun. They were dealing with similar things way back then. So does this mean, though, does this mean that we need to be always serious, never have joy when we're in the house of God? Obviously not. Psalm 2.11 says, Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Think of that phrase, rejoice with trembling. John Calvin commented on that verse. He said, The only true and salutary joy is that which arises from resting in the fear and reverence of God. In other words, Calvin described reverence as the place where joy and fear are held together. 
We don't have to choose between reverence or joy, right? We have to be serious, somber, you know, reverent and look angry. <laughs> it's both. It's not an either or. In fact, the New Testament calls us to reverence and the Old Testament calls us to joy. You might think it's the opposite, but they both call us to both, right? So in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's from the New Testament calling us to reverent worship. And the Old Testament calls us to joy. Psalm 100, verse 2, serve Yahweh with gladness. Serve him with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Here's another one on joy and worship in the Psalms. Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Oh, come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So come into his presence with joy. You don't have to pick between one or the other. We need to come with reverence and joy. Okay, with all that being said, let's everybody stand for the stand in reverence and joy to hear the living, holy, and inerrant word of God. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 through 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near is or to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much bus busyness and the fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should <coughs> vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, there is vapor, but God is the one you must fear. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So last week, we saw that we should draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who are not even aware of what they are doing. And I think that just going through the motions of the liturgy, I think doing that when our head and heart are somewhere else could be considered a sacrifice of fools. We might be tempted to think without really thinking it or without really admitting it, Hey, at least I came to church. My attention and affections don't really matter, right? At least I'm here. What more do you want? Well, he wants your attention and your affections. That's what more he wants. We also saw that we should be slow to speak, especially when we're speaking to God. Don't be rash with your mouth, especially when you're making vows to God, as we'll see today. And the reasoning for that was in verse 2, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Why should you be slow to speak when you're talking to God? He's in heaven. He's God. We're not. We're on earth. Yes, he's our Abba Father, but he's also our Heavenly Father. Yes, he's our Father who art in heaven, but also hallowed be his name. If there ever was a time to show him and acknowledge the fact that he is God and we're not is when we assemble together for corporate worship and to do it with reverence and awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Again, verse 3 says, For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. Another way we can offer a sacrifice of fools in our worship with many words is when our intentions and aspirations go much further than our actions. James 4, 13 through 17 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such 
in such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Right from Ecclesiastes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Jeff, as Jeff Myers puts it in his commentary, he says, this kind of arrogant, self-serving speech occurs in the church whenever we want to set, set ourselves apart from someone else as more pious and committed. We accomplish this by making some sort of promise about the future, which we subsequently and conveniently forget when the future finally gets here. Your life is a mist, your life is a vapor, so let your words be appropriate rather than a sacrifice of fools. We make promises, we, we, we say certain things, and we don't know what our life is going to be. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. For a dream comes, it says in our text, with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. Another way to look at that is when you become overwhelmed with the matters of the matters and the busyness of life or the business of life, your mind is distracted from the fact that God is God and we're not. Could this be describing how your focus and dreams are mainly on success and much business, and so when you thoughtlessly speak many words mindlessly in worship, you are nothing more than a fool's voice with many words. We see a clear illustration of this when God's people were delivered out of slavery by God's grace and wandering through the wilderness, we see how God's worship was profaned by the very sons of the high priest Aaron. Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3 says this, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. We can't make excuses for them and say, Well, at least they were there. At least they were trying at least they were worshiping in their own way, right? God takes very seriously what we say, what we do, our, our, what we think in our worship. Aaron learned this lesson best when he saw his sons consumed by fire because they didn't take worship seriously. Again, Hebrews 12, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer, offer, offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That's New Testament. You can't say, well, that happened back then. We all know that the Bible warns us about talking too much. Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgressions are not lacking but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then verse 26 in James 1, if anyone thinks he's, a religi he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worth it, worthless. The strong language concerning just being rash with your mouth, just talking too much. As we are seeing in our text, this is even more true. This is even more true in our corporate worship. If it's, if it's dangerous and, and foolish to talk too much, just on a normal basis, how much more true is it when we come to worship God? Not only should we be careful and cautious about what we say in worship, but we should really be careful and cautious about vows we make to God in worship. And that's what we see next in our text, verse Verses 4 and 5 says this. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow, 
It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. This is a reference to the Old Covenant law regarding vows. It's Deuteronomy 23, starting in verse 21. It says this, If you make a vow to Yahweh your God, you should not delay fulfilling it. For Yahweh your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your, your lips. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips. For you have voluntarily vowed to Yahweh your God what you have promised with your mouth. In other words, when it comes to making promises to God, you better keep them. Right? That really matters. We all make commitments to others and we don't, that we don't keep. But when it comes to our commitments to God, it's so much even more important that we keep our promises. It is easy in our corporate worship to make promises that we never intend to keep. I think we do that way more than we think we do. We thoughtlessly say to God that we are going to do things that we don't plan on doing. We do this mainly in our songs and in our prayers. Right? We're singing things that we might not even be thinking about. Right? We're singing promises to God. We're making commitments to God in our songs, in the hymns. It's all over the psalms. So you're making vows and, and not intending to keep it, not even paying attention to that. You're not even realizing you're making those promises and commitments. In our prayers, we, we make promises. In our confessions, well, be careful, little mouths, what you sing. Well, be careful, little mouths, what you pray. I think this happens all the time in our confessions as well. How many of you have confessed a sin on your knees in our liturgy and knew fully well that you had no real intention to stop doing what you were confessing? If you confess the same thing every Lord's Day, you know this is true, right? Repentance is not just saying that you're sorry. It's a turning. It's a change of behavior. Just in singing the Psalms on the Lord's Day, we are often making vows that we don't really intend to keep. We're not thinking or meaning what we're singing. And this is not a small matter. This is a big deal. For example, Asaph says in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Do you really mean that? There's nothing on earth I desire besides you. David says in Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's a commitment, right? I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Really? If you're praying or singing these things, mean it. We say and pray and sing all kinds of things in our worship. Sometimes I think we're not even paying attention. And this is what our text is warning us about. This is what our text is telling us. That's irreverent worship when you're not really meaning what you're saying. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. We, we know we do this. Like with music, uh, we used to love, we used to like the movie Grease, which is really a, not a good movie. And we never realized it. I guess my parents never realized it. We had the record with the songs that are really bad. And we didn't even know it. We'd be playing, singing. Troy would be doing the dance, you know. <laughs> Disco. Oh, no, that's a different movie. Um, but you don't, you don't even realize you're saying some pretty bad stuff. Well, it goes the other way, too. When you're singing good things, when you're making commitments to God, you, sometimes you just don't think about it. So this is a call for when we sing to pay attention to what you're singing, right? Think about the lyrics. Don't just sing it and go through the words. Think about what you're saying or singing. There's so many modern pop songs that we sing and don't realize how horrible the lyrics are. If you're a parent, you might have watched a movie, you had a real favorite movie and you finally want to show your kids the movie that was one of your favorite movies. Then like 
10 minutes into it, oh, turn it off, we're not going to watch this. <laughs> Never realized. This can't and shouldn't happen in our corporate worship, our corporate worship of the triune God. Be not rash with your mouth, it said back in two, verse 2, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. What a sad thing it is that we probably lie the most when we gather together to worship God as the people of God. We thoughtlessly make vows to God that we never intend to keep. We promise to stop doing things we never intend to stop. It's okay to make a vow to God. That's a good thing, but you better intend to quickly keep it. This also includes our vows that we make when we're in trouble. God, if you get me out of this, I'll do this. Psalm 66, verse 13 and 14. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I'll, I'll come and I'll, I'll keep my commitments. And those vows might have been to bring sacrifices to the altar or bring uh, gifts or whatever. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay, it says in verse 5. Psalm 50, verse 14, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Psalm 65, 1, praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. Psalm 60, or 76, 11, make your vows to Yahweh your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. And this brings us back to the topic at hand. He's to be feared. Everything we do in our worship, including our vows, must be intentional, not thoughtlessly, and, and it must be done rever reverently with, in reverence and godly fear. We're not here to just go through the motions mindlessly. We need to mean what we say and actually think about what we are doing. If we're making vows in our confession or songs or prayers, mean it, because we don't want our worship to be evil, as it said back in verse 1, to draw near to listen, that means pay attention to the words, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they're doing evil. We might not realize that we're doing evil. If we can't control what we say, especially in our worship, our words can lead us into sin when our actions fail to be consistent with our words. Proverbs 10, 14, The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. And then in verse 6 of our text, Ecclesiastes 5, 6, it says, Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. The messenger, I believe, is the priest in the tabernacle or the temple. And, and you made vows and you come in and you didn't, you're not paying them. You're not paying the vows. And you, he says, don't tell the messenger, it was a mistake. I forgot. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Yeah. Don't say it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your work and destroy the work of your hands? Again, Myers explains it well. He says, when Solomon writes, do not say before the messenger, it was a mistake, he's referring to the temple messenger who would be the priest or Levite before whom the person has made his vow he comes to ask why you haven't done what you promised. Now, at a later date, the man who took the rash vow must confess to the priest or pastor that his vow was made by mistake. The Hebrew word for mistake here is always used in the sense of an inadvertent error. It was unintentional and unpremeditated. The meaning of that word is established in Leviticus and Numbers when appropriate sacrifices are required for inadvertent sins, that is, sins that were not committed with a high hand. Notice that even though inadvertent, being unable to fulfill such a vow is a sin and must be dealt with. It is, very, it is a very risky prospect. God will be angry with you and destroy the work of your hands. That's Myers. Of course, the seriousness of making vows in the congregation of the saints was not just an Old Testament thing. We all know the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? I'll just read it as a reminder. 
But a man named, and this is Acts 5, starting in verse 1. A man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, this is not socialism or whatever. This was all voluntary. These were things they bowed voluntarily to, to give. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? In other words, you had the land, you owned it. But you said when you sell it, you're going to give the proceeds to, you're going to give it. But so you had it, you could have just not vowed to give it. It says, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in. Boy, she was really late for church. <laughs> Not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young man came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. That's the New Testament. Lying at church led them to lying six feet under. Again, we all make all kinds of promises in the Lord's service, and sometimes we aren't even paying attention. As it says in the last verse in our text, it's kind of a summary verse of the whole text, verse 7. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, there is vapor, but God, God is the one you must fear. God is the one you must fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge, it's the beginning of understanding worship rightly. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please All right, stand. this is uh, written by Ben Zorns. He says this, at, at this feasting table of the Most High God, we must banish from our minds the notion that he has brought us near by the blood of his son and by the regenerating power of the Holy Ghost in order to be a, miser, a miserly uh, distributor of the grace and virtue needed to live in holiness before him. There is no scarcity of grace here upon this table of the Lord. Consider these promises of his word. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21, 7. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, 3. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we... How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. The sign of these covenant promises is a small thing, a bite of bread and a mouthful of wine. So the blessings of the covenant are broad and high and deep and wide, strength to resist sin, boldness to proclaim the name of Christ, mercy for repentance, courage to defy the wicked, daily bread for every temporal need, endurance for trials great and small, joy regardless of circumstance, liberty to walk as Jesus walked, contentment in all things, thankfulness for all things, and best of all, the assurance that God through Christ has lavished his great love upon you. When you come by faith, you will not find this table empty. By faith, your hands hold the everlasting Christ and you are held by the everlasting arms of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So take this bread and this wine and know with certainty that by faith God promises you an inheritance of all things. For in Jesus 
you are numbered as his sons and daughters. So come and welcome to the king's table. 